What is going on, everyone? I am Pat the Pac-Man. Welcome to another episode of Barking for Balance, the podcast where we talk about dogs primarily, but we talk about whatever it is that we decide to talk about for that day. Today, I want to go over a little bit about how to correct the dog from entering your space while you're eating, how to deal with that. Um, I also want to go over something that I call practice before the big game. It actually happened to me today on an appointment, and I think it's something that definitely should be addressed, especially since it's something that I've been through when I was doing my training and, and learning how to do uh, the dog behavior and learning how to, how to deal with dogs. And uh, it's something that I dealt with socks. And you know what? I want to talk a little bit more about socks. I know we, we talked a little bit about socks um, during our, our, uh, one of our other podcasts, but you know, he deserves a little bit more information. So I want to go through some more stuff about him. And, uh, you know, there's some Sicilian along the way, maybe some food talk, you know, that's what we go through. So anyway, um, let's go through the, the, the practice before the big game, because this kind of ties in with exactly what I'm trying to, I want to try to teach you guys as far as what to do when you're eating. Because when I was uh, working with socks and I was teaching him how to not be in my space while I was eating, you know, I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with it. I'm sure you've seen it. Dogs that are around you, you know, they're whining. They're like two inches away. If you're on the couch, they're like right here. It's, it's very disrespectful. You know, in the dog world, space equals respect. So it's not just about anything. It's, it's, it, there's, for a lot of, there's a lot of reasons behind why this is important. But it's very important because from a dog psychology standpoint, from a dog behavior standpoint, um, in order to make them well-behaved and well-balanced and we, you know, to establish those directions, boundaries, and limits that we always talk about. When you're eating, you need to make sure that you are demanding and expecting to be respected. Um, and this is going to be pertaining to other people while they're eating as well. So giving you distance while you're eating is necessary, but also giving you distance under other circumstances just as important. But for this episode, we're just going to talk about like mealtime, you're eating at the dinner table, whatever the case may be. And how do we deal with that? So when I was working with socks, is when he was coming, when he first came home with me, um, I would eat at the dinner table, and of course, as soon as I would sit down on my ass, would touch the chair, he would comes right over. And at the time, he was very, very rambunctious, so he actually would jump on me, jump on the table. Just it was just a nightmare. So I had to work with him on on, on fixing that. So let's go over a little bit of, of what that process looks like now. Look, I, I know there's a bunch of different uh, opinions on what to do and how to do it. You use treats, you do place command, all this bullshit. This is what I do. Um, you know, if you don't, if, you know, some viewers don't like it. I don't really give a shit. It works. This system works. Um, you know, it works for my clients. It definitely works for me. So this is what I do. And that's what I'm teaching. If anybody doesn't like it, do a podcast and teach the world your way. God bless you. If it works, whatever. Anyway. So let's get the trolls out of the way right off the bat because I know that's coming. But anyway, so let's get started on that. But fun, cool, they trolls. So what I did was from, from an understanding of, of, dog, of dogs and how, they, how they, they deal with each other, they don't communicate with verbal commands or, uh, or anything else or with food or any kind of like bribery type system. They communicate with energy and body language. So what I like to do when I'm trying to establish a boundary, when I'm trying to establish uh, space, when I'm trying to let my dog move back and give me some space based on what it is that I'm doing, I like to get face to face with them. And then I like to walk towards them. Everything that you're talking, that you're doing when it comes to dog, let's just preface this, which we talked about on another podcast and I'm, it's going to be repeated a million times. So let's make this a million and one is about being calm. You can't get frustrated. You can't get angry. You can't get annoyed. This is why you're there to teach. It's, I'm sorry. This is why you're there. It is to teach. So you can't be frustrated and angry and get upset when the results aren't there. You're learning. Your dog's learning. Be patient. Relax. And this is where it's going to tie in with my whole concept of practice before the big game. So the process of what I like to do is stay in front of them and then just walk towards them. What they're going to do is they're going to back up. Okay. You're going to walk towards them. They're going to back up. If they try to go around you, then you step to the side. If they try to go the other side, you step to the side. You don't want to get into this whole dancing routine where you're going back and forth and front and back. You're doing this whole tango thing, all this, uh, this, uh, none of that shit. You're not dancing. It's just side, side, forward. And that's the, that's the direction. So if you're, if you're moving towards them, chances are they're going to start backing up right away. So once they start backing up and they reach a spot 
that is suitable to your liking as far as how much distance they're giving you, then you could give them like a general command, stay and wait, whatever the hell you're, you're into there. Stay, you turn around, you go back to your, to your dinner. Now what's going to happen is while they're learning, they're not going to stay. They're going to move forward again. So some dogs are a little sneaky. So they're going to a little, little couple of inches and eh, it's not a big deal. That's, it is a big deal because that's giving an inch they're going to take a mile. So they're going to continue to go inch by inch until they get back into your space. So what you're, trying to, what you're teaching them is that space equals respect. They already know this. It's in their instincts. This is what they do. So we have to just ask them to give us space. It's really that simple. And that's how dogs do it. They move towards each other. The other dog backs up. They get into a spot. You, move, you, you, you wait for them to either sit down or lay down. And you could help them with that. You give them a little nudge with your hand. Don't use treats, no words, just little nudge with your hand, sitting down, laying down, you turn around, you go back to your dinner. You get back up if they move forward and you repeat the process over and over and over again. It's pretty simple, I think, right? It's pretty simple. It's simple. It's not complicated. We complicate it because when they keep pushing us and they keep moving forward, then we get frustrated. And that's the problem. So we can't have that happen. You can't lose your calmness. You have to be calm and relaxed. And don't be afraid to be just a little assertive about it. Hey, knock it off, go. And then they move back. They wait, they get into their spot, stay, you turn around, you go back. Okay. It's just a repetition. Go. You could use like some words like that. You don't want to have a whole sentence. No, come on, let's go. Let's go. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's. No, that's just excitement. It's going to get them all revved up. They're already excited because they smell your steak. You know what I'm saying? Or fasuola, or whatever it is that you're eating, they're getting excited already. Whatever it is that you're eating, they're excited already. Don't use your words. Minimize your words. Short, slow movements. That's the magic. Okay? So I'll repeat it again. Walk towards them. Go. They move back. You want them to sit. Give them a little touch with your, on their butt. Make them sit. Stay. You turn around. You go back to your dinner. Okay? And just repeat the process over and over again. Very simple. It ain't complicated. So that's how I like to do when it comes to like asking for space. Now, in that particular case, when I was doing this with socks, that's exactly the experience that I encountered was a dog who being a pit bull, he was very, 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 very persistent, very stubborn. And also he was very excitable. I mean, that was one of the areas that I had to struggle with him was the fact that he was just so persistent and so excitable and he just would not take no for an answer. He just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing to the point where I was like, you know what, this is just crazy. So I would lose my patience. I would lose my, my temper. I would get angry and frustrated and annoyed in the whole bit. That's, that's just, it's human nature. So we got to condition ourselves not to do that. And so I remember that when I was doing this with him, especially the first time, I remember it took me 45 minutes before I was able to take one bite of food. 45 minutes, because as soon as my ass would touch the chair, boom, he would come right back in. Like it was just a constant. I would, my ass would hit the chair, boom, I have to get back up and repeat the process over and over again. And for 45 minutes until I sat down and he didn't move, I took a bite of food. Hallelujah. That was not how it happened. Signore vi ringrazio. But that's, that's kind of like how it happened. So, um, and I, and that's where one of the areas where I kind of learned not to, you know, lose my temper and lose my patience. So, that's that's really the key so so that was very frustrating for me to teach him something at that point now here was the mistake that i made and the mistake that i made is you know, i just noticed i'm having a really bad hair day today i know that's a little bit of a tangent but i just i took a shower a little while ago and i just can't get my hair to look the way i want it to look jesus christ you know when it comes to hair just so just so you guys know hair is uh hair is a little bit of of my weakness you know uh if you ask me what my biggest fear is, it's losing my hair, which I don't believe what's going to happen. I thought I've done a lot of research. I'm pretty self-aware and understanding as to how this all works. And I believe unless there's some, some bullshit with all this, that the main way that you're, you know, most people lose their hair is it's because it's hereditary. So um, I'm pretty good because my dad had a full head of hair, both grandfathers on, on, on both my grandfathers um, had a full head of hair. So I believe I'm pretty safe. I'm not going to have any of those problems. Plus, I take precautions. You know, you don't wash your hair. You don't shampoo your hair uh, every day. You don't use combs. Don't wear hats all day. Uh, don't use gel. And I forget the other stuff. But I don't do any of that stuff. And but the, hered the being hereditary 
is uh, is the biggest one and I'm pretty secure. So I'm, you know, no bald spots. I'm in good shape. And listen, I don't care if it's, I always tell everybody, I don't care if it turns fluorescent purple, as long as it stays on the head. You know what I mean? You got big nice side and that No, not nice spot. Don't not eat you. No. Then not they as long as they as long as it stays on the head, it could turn any color it wants. I don't care. I'm already getting a couple of grays on the side over here, you know, a little uh, old age. Hey, it happens, but as long as it stays on the head, I'm happy. But yeah, I'm a little annoyed because it's just not doing what I want it to do. And I have a bad hair day, you know, I'm sure you guys can relate. It's a pain in the ass, but yeah, fear of hair. How many of you guys have, have a fear of losing their hair as a top, their top fear? Listen, I'd rather get eaten alive by a by by a shark than lose my hair. That's how that's how it is. Anyway, I don't know. I just saw my just saw it and it went in a little tangent. So sorry about that. What are you gonna do? I told you we talk about whatever we're not talk about here. You know what I mean? So that's how that's how the that's how barking for balance works. It's about balance. Right now, we're talking about hair. Hey, there's worse things, right? I care about my hair. What are you gonna do? Anyway, so um, so practice before the big game. What does that mean? It means that my mistake when I was working on that particular exercise was that I was doing it when it was the real deal. What that means is that I should have set time aside to practice that activity so that when it was legitimately meal time, he would have done this so many times before that at that point he would have been used to it. And the reason why practice before the big game is so important is because when you're in the process of sitting down to have dinner, like I was, and, you know, it was frustrating for me because, you know, I was hungry. You know, I'm Italian. And it wasn't like I was eating. I was, I don't even remember what I was eating, but it wasn't anything like I wasn't eating a pasaki side or a tripa or usfinchone. I wasn't eating anything great. Or arancine, mm, rice balls, arancine, mm, those are good stuff. My mom and my brother make good ones. But, it wasn't like I was, I was eating anything fantastic, but it was meal time. So my focus, 100% of my focus was on eating. That's, that's what I cared about, you know? So I, 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 I made the mistake where my focus should have been on teaching him, but that time period, it wasn't. So what I did going forward was I would set time aside and I would pretend like it was meal time. And my focus was 100% on teaching him what to do. So this way, I wasn't distracted by having to eat. I already have eaten. No problems. So I was able to focus and deal with teaching him and it worked much better because practicing before the big game is so, is so important. Like football players, you know, football players don't just get on, you know, just put their pads up, put a helmet on and just go on the field and start playing. No, they do you know, they practice getting hit. They have scrimmages. They have preseason. You know, they have a bunch of different ways where they're practicing to get hit. And that is, that is, is meant for them to be conditioned psychologically and physically to getting hit. So this way, it's not like a shock to them. And the same thing, the same process should be applied when we're teaching our dogs to perform certain activities, when we're establishing directions, bounds, and limits, when we're teaching them what it is that we want them to do, what the expectations are, then we have to understand that that's what we're there for. So we need to carve out some time to do that. So when it's the real deal, they've done it a million times. They know exactly what to do, you know? So I would set myself up at the table, have some, some food. And of course I used to eat it anyway, so it didn't really matter. So, but I would set it up, but it, it wasn't like the actual time to, 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 to eat, you know? And I would just, just do it sporadically, just get some food, powerful smell, get his nose going, let him think that this was the real deal. And then we would practice. So this is, this is a ritual that um, I teach to a lot of my clients, all of my clients really in, in order to get the results when it's time. So for example, like, like going out the door, you know, the process of going out the door for a walk is the first step to going for a walk. We're going to get to that another time, but that's the first step to going for a walk. So you have to work on that as a separate exercise, not do it when it's time for them to go out to the bathroom or go for a walk. You know, you want to practice this door exercise, as I call it, sporadically throughout the day. So when it's really time for them to go out, whether it's the bathroom or for a walk, when it's basically time for them to truly go out, they've done that activity so many times that the brain is already conditioned to this is what we do at the door. No big deal. And the same activities with food. You got to remember food with dogs 
you know, it's going to get them excited. It's food, you know, especially if it's something that smells, you're having steak or, you know, anything really like my dogs go crazy, no matter what I'm eating, you know, but they have to learn to have manners. That's really key. So they give you space and that's the way they show respect. And then you want to invite them into your space and give them some of that food, which is one of the things that I do, you know, now is the process has evolved where during my dinner time, they're doing exactly what they've been taught. Socks and Pepper have done, are, have, are do, do exactly what they've been taught all those years prior, which is they just give me space. They laying down calmly. They don't care about what's going on. And then when I'm done, I call them over and I give them some, a little piece of what I'm eating. Whatever it is that I'm eating, they get a piece of it. And if it's something that they can't have, then I'll just give them treats of their own so that they can, you know, they, they're still participating in the process. And that's their reward for doing exactly what it is they want to be doing. That, I'm sorry, that, that exactly what it is that I want them to be doing, which is being calm and also giving space in the presence of food. Those are the two things that you want. You want them to be calm and you want them to be giving you space. Key, space and calmness. I'll say it another time. Space and calmness. That's what you're after. So you can't you know, create an excited mind. You have to create a calm mind and that's how you do it. Then you reward the calmness and you reward them giving you space with exactly what it is that they want to begin with. So everybody's happy. You know, balance. Circle is complete. Man, this hair is a pain in the ass. But anyway, um, I don't want to go down that road again. So, and no, I'm not shaving my head in case anybody's asking. So yeah, so practice it before the big game. Anything that you're doing, you want to set time aside so that it fits the feeding process, the exiting or entering doors, the while you're eating, whatever it is that you're trying to, to teach your dogs, to whatever directions, whatever rules, whatever boundaries, whatever limits you're trying to set, carve out time so it doesn't interfere with your normal routine. You know, this way, when it's real deal, They've done it a million times. It's not a problem, okay? So practice before the big game is kind of a, kind of a, um, a mantra that I'd like to follow. And I think you guys should follow it. You'll get, you'll get a lot out of it. So uh, practice that actually when it comes to food, you know? Um, the whole thing, you're standing up, walking towards them. It works brilliantly. It works so well to create, again, calmness and distance. It just, that just does that. It's just that the repetition of it is necessary to get it ingrained in the mind. You know, but most of the time, again, why calm, being calm and relaxed is so crucial in this process is because your dog is going to know the fact that you're starting to get aggravated. So it's just a matter of time before you give up. And that's what most people do. Their dogs will push, 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 push until you know what? I had enough. I suck. I'm Yeah, get a manchad. That's what ends up happening. You know, you get aggravated. You don't do it anymore and the dog wins. And now they know how to beat you. They're going to say, come into your space. They're going to like get into your food. It's just, you know, and that's just, you know, one area, but it's not specifically that problem. It's what that specific problem, how it kind of ripples into a whole bunch of other behavioral issues too, you know? So if you're not getting respect in that area, imagine where else you're not getting respect in. Most likely nowhere else. So that one particular thing, just like all other particular area where it's like, I don't mind this and I don't mind this and I don't mind that. Yeah. Well, when you don't mind this, all this other shit starts to appear too. And now that's the stuff that you mind. So let's focus on each individual area. This way you have a perfect dog, the dog that's happy, fulfilled, and well-behaved. That's how it works. And everybody's content and everybody's good. So yeah. You know, and I talk about socks a lot and you're going to hear me talk about socks a lot because, you know, I'm here because of him, you know, um, God blessed me with him exclusively because he knew that he was the dog that I needed to, to become the Pac-Man, you know, to become a dog behavior uh, and rehabilitation specialist. When I was searching for my pit bull that I wanted to rehabilitate, the pit bulls that I was finding really weren't, they weren't anything that I could, they were just, they were just training. It would have been training. So I never would have really realized and come into this position where I had to like go force myself out of this comfort zone to learn and grow and mature and, um, you know, become something different. Otherwise it was just been like, you know, knickknacky stuff. And, and I probably would have been working at a local little, little Sally, Sally May dog, dog Academy for food, for, for pooches or whatever corny ass name there, you know, with a bunch of treats with my little, my little pouch hanging from my hip, like a little kangaroo and all that shit. And that's where it would have been at. But this is, this, this is how it developed. It kind of like forced me in the war. It put me in the worst case scenario and it forced me to win. It forced me to dig myself out. And that's why we're here. So that's why I owe socks quite a bit 
you know, um, socks is, is so important to the point that, you know, we have a new logo and, uh, which I'm going to show you guys. And, um, Socks is featured on this new logo. I wanted him to be the center of a logo with basically uh, an, uh, an image of me, you know, opening up my shirt like uh, like a superhero. And right in the center is uh, is, uh, is is socks, and it's a big circle. He's in a circle because we talk about the circle being complete. You know, my job was to provide him what it is that he wanted and needed first, and then in return, he was able to provide me what it is that I wanted and needed after that. And so that's why I always say the circle is complete, but it starts from me providing the dog, then the dog provides me. It's done it the other way around where most people make that mistake. Um, you know, and so, so, so that's why, you know, he's immortalized now in, 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 in the new logo and the company logo for that reason, because he's really, you know, Cesar Milan created it and then, you know, Socks brought it out. And, um, and that's, that's why I dedicated that, that new logo to him. You know, I wanted him to be immortalized in it and it then they, you know, they did a great job. So I'm really happy about it. But, um, you know, one of the things about, about, about finding socks back in the day when I was a financial, it was during the time when I was a financial advisor and why I say God made me, made, made me find him. He was, he wanted me to me and him to be with, with each other, not necessarily just because I needed him, but I think, you know, he also needed me. He, you gotta remember he was, he was, a, he was, a, he was returned back to the shelter three times because of his behavioral issues. And I was about to become number four. So, you know, he needed me just as much as I needed him. And so, that's why the, the bond that he's like right laying right next to me right now, you know, the bond that we share is just incredible. And when I look back at how much I hated him and how, how miserable he made me. And now I look now at how I, I couldn't, I can't imagine not having him around. Um, it, it just, it's, you know, it's, it's just very emotional. And um, it, again, it's, it's God that, that blessed me with this because um, it's, it's, it's more than just dog training and jobs. And it was just, it was, a, it was a gift. I mean, we, we saved each other, you know, we, we saved each other's lives. Like he's my superhero, you know, and, uh, he's the socks man. And, um, uh, and the reason why his name is socks, by the way, the shelter actually named him. He's black and he has, uh, his front, the, 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 the bottom portion of his feet is, are white. So it looks like he's wearing socks. So I guess what, that's what the show, the shelter named him. And I liked it. So I kept it, but, um, you know, yeah. yeah so like I said, yeah, it's, uh, he was the dog that we were meant for each other. So all the other dogs that, um, you know, all the, all the other dogs that, um, you know, wouldn't have worked out and, Socks is, is, is my, my, my buddy and, um, I'm blessed to have him and é bedro, é, é bedro, é bedro como o culo ruatariedro. So let me talk about that a little thing because, because Socks is, that's not just smart. He's also beautiful, you know, and that phrase I just said, bedro. Como o culo ruatariedro, which is a, a line my mom says a lot. And bedro means beautiful, and culo means ass, and atariedro means cat. So the Sicilian saying basically says that you're beautiful like the ass of a cat. So it's kind of like a little sarcastic way of saying how beautiful you are. Bedro como o culo ruatariedro. Anyway, so, so, you know, this, this whole thing is making me think of shit that I had not remembered in such a long time. Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord have mercy. My, when my mom sees this stuff, she is going to kick my ass for saying things. Oh, good Lord. But anyway, so yeah, so we'll, we'll get into that another, on another level. So, you know, the bottom line is um, I want to come across, I want to, I want to remind you guys again, practice before the big game. Uh, practice that exercise when it comes to how to uh, ask a dog to give you space. And if you have any questions about that, just let me know and I'll, 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 uh, I'll show you. Um, I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about how to get that done, but it's a very effective, it's a very simple technique and very effective and it works much better than any other technique that involves treats and toys and all that bullshit. Um, yeah. So anyway, thank you for joining Barking for Balance. I hope you guys had a great time. I certainly did. Catch you next time. Remember, be patient, positive, peaceful and persistent. BP4. That's what it stands for. See ya.